What's up, guys? Thanks for tuning into this episode of Thinking Bigger with Kevin Feely. In today's episode, I sit down with my friend and mentor, Jeff Fenster. If you guys don't know who Jeff Fenster is, he is a very, very, very successful entrepreneur. Uh, he built Everbowl, which is a healthy restaurant that now just opened up their 100th location. They're partnered with a bunch of the biggest names that you've ever even heard of, uh, and he's very humble about it. He also owns a company, We Build, which builds out other restaurants and out Everbowl locations. He talks about how to be a successful entrepreneur, how not to be a wannabe entrepreneur, which I know a lot of people... Uh, are. And we talk about relationship building, money making, all sorts of stuff. And I'm telling you, this episode is really, really good. If you're an entrepreneur, if you're interested in business and you're trying to make more money, this is the episode for you. So again, thank you for tuning in to Thinking Bigger with Kevin Feely. Let's get into it. Jeff Fenster. What's up, man? What's up, dude? Thanks for having me. Thank you. Very yeah. awesome studio. Thank you very much. Okay. I appreciate you coming down. Um, I know you're, you know, Vista's not too far, but I appreciate you giving me your time. No, man, it's my pleasure. And congratulations. I really like it. I think what you got here is awesome. And I hope more people get exposed to it, especially if you're in the San Diego area and come on down and rent some space. Yeah, thanks. You heard it right from Jeff Fenster himself, who has a fantastic studio that just steamrolls this. <laughs> no, no, it's different, different utility, different purpose. It's different, you know, but it's the NFL and I'm the high school football team. That's, no. that's doing good though, you know, so. That's, no. I, don't, I don't agree. Yeah. I don't agree. I All think right. it, it serves the, this serves a purpose for a lot of people. What I have isn't necessary. Yeah. You don't need a Ferrari to go to the grocery store. Sure. Right. You but a Ferrari a, is nice to have, right? Yeah, but you still don't take it to the grocery store. Yeah. It's right. a, it serves a purpose. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I love the, the studio. And for those of you that don't know, the studio that we launched is Content Factory San Diego. It's a video podcast studio that you can rent out. And if you're interested, go to contentfactorysandiego.com and enter code FIRST-50, that's five zero, and get 50% off your first booking. No brainer. Right off the Literally, bat. Literally, hit pause, go do that, and come back and listen to the rest of this episode. Cool. Thanks, Jeff. So, um, so tell me a little bit about your, your history. You own Everbowl, you own WeBuild, you have done, uh, I mean, you were in the payroll business, you worked for ADP, you're partnered with guys like Shaq and Drew Brees, you have a fantastic resume. So tell everybody who somehow doesn't know you a little bit about yourself. Well, uh, married, girl dad, two daughters, one's about to be 19 and the other one's about to be 13, um, first and foremost. And you know, I'm, I think at this point I'm a serial entrepreneur. Never thought of myself as one until I became one, but really I like to solve problems by starting companies and innovating and creating businesses because I just really enjoy it. You know, I had always thought I was going to be a professional athlete, didn't end up happening, went to law school, sports agent, had a kid and realized I didn't want to travel around representing uh, athletes, so I had to pivot to the real world and business. And like you said, I got a quick job selling payroll for ADP while I was paying off law school loans and supporting my, my daughter and found out I was pretty good at selling. I have a uh, big relationship network. And I've been building that and curating that since I was younger. So I was able to leverage that early on in my professional career and use a concept called solution based selling, which is the opposite of transactional sales. It's really figuring out the long term solutions to solve people's problems. And when you can do that over time, you build great friendships, and you sell a lot of whatever it is you're selling. And so it was very successful didn't work out in corporate America for yeah. uh, one main reason, but I wasn't prepared to wait to the end of the fiscal year every year for what was earned because yeah. I had a contract and I earned it. And it was something with a bonus at the end of yeah, the year. Yeah, so right? I had earned a $17,000 bonus and yeah. they told me I had to wait six months to get it even though I had earned it already. And just, I scored the touchdown, put the points on the board, let's keep going. Yeah. And it just didn't work out. And so I quit my job in a heat of the moment and started my first company out of my mom's kitchen, which was a payroll business. Figured out how to scale. I love startups. You know, I was able to sell that, started a digital marketing agency, partnered with Neil Patel, yep. scaled it. We sold that um, recruiting agency, tried retirement for a little while, realized <laughs> I, I'm not mentally set up for that. And so it was like, what can I see myself doing? And really leaned into vertical integration, starting companies, relationship capital, uh, making friends and just having a lot of fun and not worrying too much about what I do. Right. And so I have Everbowl, which is a restaurant chain. We have, we're about to open our hundredth unit around the wow, country. Congratulations. Thank you. And Everbowl is is really good. I actually took somebody uh, who's in the office there yesterday oh. and I was going to pick up a hat, you know, because I wanted to represent <laughs> some merch and uh, didn't want to wear, I have an Everbowl hoodie, didn't want to wear that because it was too hot. But uh, Everbowl is really good. So if you get a chance, go to Everbowl. And if there isn't one near you, you can definitely reach out to us because we're opening them literally every week somewhere in the in the U.S. Um, 
you know, uh, construction manufacturing and fabrication company called WeBuild, where we not only build all the Everbulls, but we partner with, you know, big names and regular names that are growing and scaling uh, physical footprints, whether it's restaurants, service industry, gyms, doesn't matter. Um, have a food manufacturing and import company called Unevolved Products. I have a podcast called The Jeff Fenster Show. Um, I, you know, I've written some books and I travel the country speaking and yeah, I like to make friends and have fun. I mean, that's really who I am. Yeah. And you know, so your book relationship bank account is incredible. Thank um, you. it's no, it, I, I give them out to people all the time and I'll probably order more cause people are always telling me do that's such a good book. Oh, so thank you. Yeah, no, it's not just like a BS entrepreneur book because we want to write it off the, you know, check the box for it. No, it's really good. So thank you for putting that out. So you said the word, the word serial entrepreneur, which usually, and not in your case, but most of the time means unfocused, right? Uh, I heard, um, I don't remember who it was, but it was an entrepreneur, super successful guy, basically say, you know, whenever I hear somebody call themselves a serial entrepreneur, I just assume they're broke, right? <laughs> and, and I think in nine out of 10 cases, they're true. But you are very good at partnering with people and leveraging things that aren't necessarily your time. So what do you have to say about that? How have you become so successful as a serial entrepreneur, like legitimately? Well, I think first and foremost, nine out of nine point seven out of ten entrepreneurs, period, are broke. Mm. Um, it comes with the industry. Yeah. Sorry, it's just the reality. Uh, you know, this is the high stakes business arena where anybody can be your competitor at any given moment. You are always subject to macro and micro events. You're always subject to people. You're subject to all of the things that happen in the real world can change your business overnight and you have no control over it. And so as a result, most of us will fail. Most of us will fail more often than not. Right. Even successful entrepreneurs, myself included, I have failed with businesses. So the idea that entrepreneurs are only successful when they're wealthy, well, that's, that's a, a marker of success. Um, but most people don't realize what truly entrepreneurship is required. So I would preface to say whether you're serial or regular, uh, most likely most entrepreneurs you meet are broke. Yeah. Until they're not. And the <laughs> one who can figure out how to get to the top of the hill win. Just the way it goes. I would say that people use the word serial entrepreneur incorrectly. Um, there's two kinds of entrepreneurs in my mind. There's the person who has a craft and they've started a company in that craft and they're an entrepreneur. So if I was a lawyer and I worked for a law firm for a few years and I went off on my own and I started my own law practice, I'm an entrepreneur and I'm a lawyer and I do that for the next 40 years. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a lawyer. Serial entrepreneur just means the industry isn't the same over and over and over again. I jump from different industries, but still do the same entrepreneurship stuff. And I get why the comment is made because when you're broke and you haven't succeeded and you're distracted or, you know, using your time across many different facets, you're not able to lean in enough to win. And if you're not all in on your business, you're not going to win. Right. And I think the misnomer is, well, I'm a serial entrepreneur, so I don't have to dive hundred percent in the business. That's just not true. Right. When I start a new company, I do every single piece of it. When I started Everbull, I worked for four and a half months, sun up to sundown in my store. I did every job. I was there seven days a week. I damn near got divorced with my wife because she literally said, you're a millionaire working a minimum wage job and I haven't seen you in three and a half months. Come home. And I said, I'm not ready to come home. I don't know the business yet. Yeah. I know nothing about this. I started it. So you still have to do that, but then you can move yourself out when you hire yourself out of each job. Right. And then you can leverage other people to grow your company and you can appear because no one pays attention when you're not successful. Yeah. So we don't watch the journey of these companies or these entrepreneurs when there's one little store in Poway of Everbull. No one cares. Yeah. No one's following my my social media about it. No one's talking about it because no one knows who, who Everbull is or what we're doing. Right. Today, they see Everbull all over. They don't see me in the store. They assume, well, he doesn't have to be there. Yeah. Well, I can tell you, I've made more bulls than any human at Everbull probably still to this day. Yeah. That doesn't mean that I have to anymore, but you have to at the beginning. And so I would, the, whoever was that conversation you had with, I would just challenge them back and I would say, well, you are right, but I think that that's true of all entrepreneurs. That's a really good point. And all entrepreneurs have this misnomer of thinking, I want to leverage my time. I want a four hour work week, Tim Ferriss. It's not real. Yeah. You can have a four hour work week and you'll be broke and yeah. I'll kick your ass every single time and I don't care what industry it is. Yeah. You have to show up and outwork me and every other entrepreneur who you're competing with. Are you prepared to do it? Are you prepared to actually make those sacrifices? Yes or no? And if the answer is no, I would challenge you to rethink your career choices. Yeah. Go work for somebody else. You can still join a startup and have that vibe, that entrepreneurial energy that maybe you're really attracted to. Yep. But you can let someone else deal with that. 
But if you don't realize what's required and you are prepared to make those sacrifices, you're in the wrong space. Yeah. And that's why most fail. And that's how a guy like me who probably has less experience and less skill in most areas will win is just because I'm not going to quit. Yeah. And I'm going to make you work harder than you've ever imagined if you're going to compete with me. And you're probably more talented than me. And if you do, you'll beat me. Yeah. And I'll finish second, third, fourth, fifth, or fail. But I'm going to force you to do that. And it's very uncomfortable for most humans. And so I'm able to win with that simple strategy of I will outwork you. Yeah. And it seems like you're good at getting into the monotonous stuff too and not getting, or well, being okay, being bored, right? Because when you're building a new business, like, I mean, like most people would not want to be in an Everbowl building bowls for three or four months, right? They, a lot of people would have backed out before that, tried to replace themselves early. And then that's probably why they fail and you succeed, right? It's so, one of definitely one of the reasons, but I think that they're looking at, I guess I don't look at what I do. Yeah. Like making bowls, boring. I don't want to do that. How about meet every single customer in Poway, California and make friends with all the humans that are going to come back again and again and again and again and again yep. and get to know them? Yeah. What if that was what I was doing while I was making them a bowl? Yeah. Same thing, different perspective. And now I'm building a company. Right. Right. And now I'm building relationships, which enable me to do so much more later on. Yeah. One of those relationships got me on HBO Real Sports with Everbowl very early on, which allowed the very first person I ever took a check from when I did finally start to raise money, they saw me on HBO Real Sports, Everbowl, yeah. worn by a professional athlete because his pitching coach came to Poway Everbowl and saw me there three days a week, the first four months we were open, and I built a relationship with him. Yep. So how does a small little restaurant in Poway get on HBO Real Sports? Because I made friends with somebody. Not because I made the bowl, but I had to be there to make the bowl. I had to be there to make sure every employee honored our culture and what makes us ever bull and how and what we stand for and make sure every customer has that world-class experience. Right. Because LTV lifetime value is where it all is. So yes, most people start a restaurant. I started it. Lucky me. I'm there for the first week or two. And now I don't want to be there 15 hours a day. So I hire other people to try to make my dream come true. Well, what do they, what stake do they have in it? Why are they going to be me? They're not. Yeah. They don't care enough. They go home and I pay them a check. Yep. So people and entrepreneurs make a mistake to think that employees are going to push their brand and their company like they are. They're not. Yeah. And that's why you lose. And yep. so if you're not prepared to do the job, don't do the job. Right. Find That's why it is. Find what you love because otherwise you're going to lose. Yeah. Yeah. Gary Vaynerchuk always, I always hear him say all the time. One of the, It's probably one of the more common <laughs> things I hear him say when entrepreneurs ask him a question like, hey, my employees don't get, seem to care. It's like, yeah, no shit. It's not their business. Like they're Correct. getting paid you know, a lot less than you are to be doing this. Like, of course, it's not their baby. Like, of course, they're not going to show up like you show up, right? It's, it's like if you're a parent, it's like someone else watching your kid. Yeah. They're not going to get up at two in the morning when the kid's crying because it's not their kid. Right. They're not going to do those things. And if you don't realize that a business is a baby and you are the parent. Yeah. Which means it is a 24-7, 365 day. It doesn't matter if you're sick. It doesn't matter if you're tired. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. If you're not ready. And that's where I, I seriously, I, I think... The challenge is it's too easy to start a company. So the criteria of what's required is overlooked. And, oh, of course, I'm going to work hard. Great to say when you're excited, you know, bright eyed and bushy tailed on day one. Yeah. Talk to me three months from now. Right. Talk to me when things aren't going as planned. <clears throat> Are you really in this thing? And yeah. If we do that self inventory and we take the time to really assess our, our, you know, what we want, what we're prepared to do and give up and our current, you know, 12, 30, 24, 36 month uh, forward looking outlook on where our life is going. Right. Are you set up for this? Are you able to handle it? The idea of being, I mean, I was broke, broke. You know, I hear all the time, ah, well, I want to, but the butts are, I mean, when I quit ADP, I had a, uh, I wasn't quite married. We, my fiance, I was engaged and I had a daughter I, and I had a house that I had bought with money from ADP. I sold the house and I moved my fiance, daughter, and myself into my parents' house at 25 year, 24 years old and stayed till I was in uh, 25 to start my first company out of my mom's kitchen. Now, are you willing to do that? Well, I like my house. So did I. Yeah. And as a man who was getting married and had a daughter, do you know what it does to an ego to we're moving back in with my mommy and daddy? Yeah. So I can start this thing? It's not easy to do. I was prepared to make the sacrifice. The question I challenge everyone else is, if you're not going to move your life to fit what is in front of you, but I had no money. I had no way to be able to survive the next one, two, three, however long it was going to take to be successful if I had to pay rent or mortgage, mm. if I had to pay an electric bill and put food on the table and support an entire house. I couldn't. So I couldn't quit my job 
and I couldn't do the thing with 100% of my best effort. Yeah. Right? And so that's why I'm saying, like, you've got to be willing to make sacrifices. And I wish I could tell you it's more complicated because it's actually really easy. Yeah. But most people just won't do the easy because they're looking for a simpler, in the words, simpler option or one that doesn't sound so simple yeah. that they can check a box. Like, oh, well, what if I just take this course, read this story, listen to this show, um, you know, get this mentor, hire this coach. You can hire whatever coach you want. Yep. If you don't do the work, you don't do the work. Right. And if you go watch, I mean, <clears throat> Kobe Bryant was the king of this. If you go watch Kobe Bryant when he was already the end of his career and a five-time champion, he still did the basic footwork drills that middle school kids do in basketball. Yep. And pros used to say, why are you doing that? And he goes, because I'm, I want to be the best in the world. Why aren't you doing that? Yeah. The basics, the simple things. Work your ass off, get prepared, and clear everything in front of you so you can actually win. And don't be like, well, I have two months of cash. And if it doesn't work, I have this backup plan. Well, if you have a backup plan, you already lost. Right. There is no damn yes. backup plan. Stop yes. with backup plans. Have a plan. And pivot if you need to pivot on your own plan. And that's why I just think entrepreneurship and serial entrepreneurs who use the term, they use it because they jump from industry to industry, which is fine. And I'm a serial entrepreneur. And I'm not knocking anyone who's out there trying. I'm knocking people who are trying that quit and say, they're in it for the wrong reason. They're in it because they think it's a four-hour work week and millions of dollars in fancy cars and private planes. Yeah. Fun fact, less than 1% of entrepreneurs are ever going to sell their company and then 1% of that are ever going to have all those fun toys. Yeah. It's just the reality. And it takes luck. I'm sitting here because I also got lucky. I worked my ass off. But you make your own luck. I'm prepared when, when luck happens. Yeah. but Luck I mean, hits us all the same. It's just most people don't see it. But luck... Okay, so I'm I let's say I'm not great at hitting, right? I'm a sure. baseball player. Let's say I'm not great at hitting. I mean, even uh who was it? Uh uh it happened in San Diego, the pitcher, the Mets pitcher. Uh Bartolo Colon hit a home run at at Petco Park. Yep. They said he like that guy will never hit a home run. He's a chunky monkey, right? Like that guy's never and he did. He hit a home run in Petco Park and everybody went crazy. Sure. But he had enough at bats to get to that point. Yep. If you gave him one or two or three at bats, then he never would have hit that home run, right? That's correct. So you give yourself more at bats because you're outworking people. You give yourself more chances because you're shaking more hands. You're That's give definitely your, true. You know, so yes, but also it's you're right. You can definitely compound the amount of ch uh, chances you have to get lucky for sure. But luck, good luck and bad luck hit everybody. Mm. There's going to be a traffic jam when you're late for a meeting. It's going to happen to me. It's going to happen to you. Now, what if I'm never late because I'm always at 20 minutes early? Does yeah. that traffic jam uh, allow me to miss the most important meeting of my life or the most important thing? Now, was I unlucky that there was a traffic jam, but I only gave myself an amount of time assuming there wasn't a traffic jam? Yeah. That's you not, uh, not accounting for circumstance. Right. We're all going to have good situations and bad. Most people fail to recognize when those great breaks happen. Yeah. Because they just don't recognize the opportunity, right? Luck is when preparation meets opportunity. Yes. They think they're prepared, but they miss the opportunity or they have the opportunity and they're not prepared. You have to have both. Right. And then you have to create enough circumstance or at bats to have more of those opportune moments happen and you be prepared for them. Yeah. And you do that by working your ass off and owning your craft and mastering it so you can recognize when those little opportunities that are usually hidden, because if they were easy to see, they wouldn't be opportunities. Yeah. They would just be what everyone else can see. Go get a job at McDonald's. That's a, It's not an opportunity, right? It yeah. was 50 years ago when it was an upstart brand. Right. But today it's a job. Well, it's funny because just like you said, you had your uh, interaction with somebody at your store in Poway, right? That led to a deal with HBO. And it's funny because my business partner now in my main business, he was actually a customer of mine when I first met him. I thought the guy was broke when I first met him because he's super humble and chill and like just was working from like a room, right? So I kind of prejudged this guy. And what happened was he was a customer of ours. We had a cold email service that we launched and he had a problem with the service. He was really pissed. My business partner just, I don't know, dropped the ball on something. I was like, hey, I'll take care of it. I was in Ireland at the time. So the time difference is crazy. It's like three in the morning where I'm at. It's like maybe five or six where he is or whatever it was. It was regular time for him. It was dark where I was. And I get on a Zoom call and I'm helping him. And he can see behind me on the Zoom call. He's like, hey, where are you? Like, is it nighttime? Like, oh, yeah, I'm in Ireland or, you know. And uh, 
he was like, oh, dude, that's really cool. And then we just connected off that. And he saw that I went above and beyond for him, which I did for all of my customers. Now, granted, I didn't think that I was getting anything from this other than sure. doing the right thing. But then we started talking about cars and he's like, oh, yeah, I've got a Porsche 911 and Audi R8. And I'm like, at the time, you know, I'm like, wait, so, oh, OK, so you can afford cars, whatever. And then find out this guy's successful. And then he actually becomes a mentor of mine and then a good friend and then a business partner. He mm -hmm. buys into my business. And then my business went from. 40,000 a month to 350,000 a month in a year because we partnered. That's right. So if I hadn't done that one little interaction and I, and sure I got lucky cause I met him, but if I, it would have been so much easier for me to just go to sleep. Correct. You know, so and that's what I'm saying. Like you were prepared with that opportunity and you seized it. Yeah. But and I that, created my own luck. You created more opportunities for luck. That's yeah. all I'm changing. Okay. I agree with all right. you. All right. The lucky is going to happen. It's yeah. just you need enough at bats. So how do you get more at bats? You say yes. You, sure. you you do it. You keep doing those things, right? You keep doing it. Now, that's the other thing. You hit on it. It's not what's in it for me or how is this going to help me. And that's why people don't do stuff. That's that's it. They're right. like, oh, I don't see how this is going to help me, so I'm not doing it. <laughs> well, okay, then don't. I'm going to help as many people as I can because I'm going to find those lucky people, right? right? Yeah. It's just a matter of how often it's going to take. Right. And you never know. Most of the wealthiest people or successful people are humble with it. Influencers, uh, business coaches, people who need to impress or young, wealthy people do it for impressions. Yeah. They do it to impress. I could care one, less than 1% of my being gives a shit. If anyone care uh, thinks of me as wealthy, poor, I don't care. Yeah. I care what my kids think of me. Yeah. And my personal friends and family. So I don't do things to impress any, impress anybody. I'm doing it because I want to win. Right. And that quote, how you do anything is how you do everything, which, you know, has been said a million times. It's true. If you're not the person who's going to do their best, period, because that's who they are, you're not even ready to win. Mm -hmm. You're not going to win. You might get lucky and win, but it's why most of the people who win the lottery lose all their money. Yeah. They weren't the person who should have had that kind of wealth. They hadn't trained themselves and curated the human necessary, uh, capable of having that kind of wealth. So when it was given to them, they didn't know what to do with it. Yeah. Right? You have to be the person. And the way you become that person is through your daily habits. And if you say yes and attack your business, it was your business and it was a customer. So, of course, you got on there. To me, that's a no-brainer. Yeah. To a lot of people, that's like, why would you have done that? on vac I'm on vacation. Right. What does that mean? Yeah. Your business doesn't stop. Yeah. If you're on vacation and your kid has an issue, do you answer the phone? Yeah. Of course you do. It's your kid. Yeah. You know, my dad used to always say to me, never take anyone's opinion too seriously who doesn't have to live with the outcome. Everyone has an opinion. Everyone has advice. I can give you advice for your business, but I'm not in the business. Right. So don't take my advice. Listen to it. Think about it in your own life, in your own situation, and say, you know, is it good advice? Should I take pieces of this? But remember, I could tell you turn left. If I'm not in the car with you, don't take too much onus on that. Don't put too much importance on it because I'm not in the car with you. If I'm in the car with you, now take my opinion seriously because I'm going to turn left with you. But same thing with your business. Employees are never going to own your business. They're just not. They're going to go home. If it doesn't work out, they're going to get another job. So don't expect them to be you and lead you to where you need to go. You have to roll your sleeves up. You have to do it. How I'm able to leverage other people and, and therefore it appears like my time is because I attract world-class talent because they know that together we're going to win. And I find people who are entrepreneurial minded, but aren't meant to be entrepreneurs because mm. they do want to go home. They want to have work life balance yeah. to some degree. Yep. They understand that their strength is not running a company, which is a different job. We all have jobs. It's not the same job. Being the starting pitcher on a baseball team is not the same as a catcher. Yeah. You're still a baseball player, but one is the pitcher. There's only one quarterback on the football team. Yeah. That might be the face. And everyone's like, I wish I was the quarterback. You still need left tackles, right tackles, guards, receivers, running backs, et cetera. Yeah. So, what is your position? And if you can lean in and understand that, you could be the number two number. I mean, Steve Ballmer, who owns the LA Clippers, just surpassed Bill Gates in wealth. Well, Steve Ballmer did not start Microsoft. Bill Gates did. You know who was the CEO after Bill Gates? Steve Ballmer. Yeah. He didn't start the company. He ran the company. He's worth more today than Bill Gates. Yeah. He's the owner of the LA Clippers. He's one of the richest humans on the planet. Would, would you consider him a, an entrepreneur? Or is he still an entrepreneur? Uh, Steve Ballmer? Yeah. He's neither. He was a, he's a hired gun. He's a CEO. He's a professional executive. But would that be an entrepreneur? Like somebody who's kind of entrepreneurial, but they're taking less risk? 
Is that the definition of entrepreneur? I think so. That's that's what I think of it. I think of it as somebody who, you know, Gary Vee always talks about like, hey, it's better to be the number 12 guy at Facebook than the number one at a company that does zero in sales. I agree with him. Right. And and that but that's an entrepreneur, somebody who brings a lot of talent, yeah. but can't do it all and shouldn't do it all. Like well, even entrepreneurs can't do it all. Yeah. Right. I think an entrepreneur has to be the person who understands that their role is less tactical and operational and their role is predominantly more macro high level vision. Like if you have a vision for a company or an idea and it's a real vision, it's not like I just want to be a CEO or a founder. Yeah. Like I have a vision. You can see the vision and you have a a, a plan or a strategy to get there, whether it's through stuff you can do yourself or hiring, recruiting uh, talent, customers. If you need money, you can raise the capital. If you do raise the capital, then you can understand what investor relations means. You can be a chief executive officer and actually manage all the high level people, keep them motivated, build a culture and get through all the problems to get there. That's an entrepreneur. Yeah. But if I have a vision to do this and I need somebody who's world class at getting me there, I, I want to get to Hawaii and I build a boat, but I need <laughs> yeah. a captain. The captain doesn't care about my vision as much, or maybe they do, but they realize I can't build this boat. I can't find the money. I can't, but I can take us there. Right. And I hire that captain. And that captain gets to decide how we get there. So they get to be an entrepreneur minded captain, decide the path, make their own decisions, lead the team, hire who they need to hire, tell me what resources they need, and I will fulfill them. That's to me what most people should do. And I'm not just trying to dis, uh, sway anyone from not being an entrepreneur. I just, I travel the country and I meet so many entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs. And when I'm talking to them, so many of them say things like, well, you know, I have, I have all these other things and I want to stay in my current job, but I want to start this thing as a side hustle. Okay. If you want to do that to me, and I hear people say that shit all the time. I disagree. Yeah. Cause Either, it's one foot in one foot out. Right? You're going to lose. Yeah. <laughs> you're going to spend eight hours working for someone else. You lost. Yeah. I'm be I'm beating you if I'm coming into your industry. Right. I, I really am. And there's a million of me's, right? Yeah. So either decide you want to do this and to hell with everything else because your life has no, you're not inspired if you're not doing it. And I'd rather be broke doing this than make a good living and staying comfortable doing this. If you don't have that dichotomy, if you don't 100%, don't do it. Yeah. Yet, go find a company <clears throat> and be an entrepreneur. Be, be someone who can have the same entrepreneurial spirit and work in an environment that inspires you around people you love doing something that is awesome to you, whatever it is. Right. And go for it. Right. And if it doesn't work out, you did take less risk and you get to do it again. Yeah. And you get a paycheck. Yeah. Because, you know, I don't pay myself in a lot of companies. Yeah. I'm broke for a while until we make money. Yeah. I didn't take a dime out of Everbowl for three and a half years. Yep. Just writing checks. Yeah. It's a hard thing to do. It's not easy. You're taking all the financial risk. So make sure you really want to do this and you're prepared to put in the work. Well, well, let's talk about that word risk. Risk I see as a good thing, right? And same thing with failure. Like those things are positive to me, right? They suck. Nobody wants failure, but you don't get success without numerous failures. So when it comes to risk, how would you determine, like how do you define risk? And how do you get comfortable with risk and, and how do you see the, what is it? The trees through the forest? What's that called? Forest for the trees. Or I always say it the yeah. wrong way. But like, how do you see the big picture? How do you latch on to the end goal? Because I think that's the thing is, is it's the uncertainty that people can't deal with. So they see the risk. Like if you're so sold on the end result and you know it's going to happen and you are all in and you burn your bridges or burn the ships, you know, it, it will happen after time if you continue to go. Yes. So what does risk mean to you? Well, I think there's risk in everything. And I, for some reason, am baffled at what we put too much risk on. Obviously, outside of the life risk, like health. I'm going to jump out of an airplane without a parachute. No, that's too much risk. I'm sorry. I'm, yeah. not, I'm not into that. But starting a business and putting my financial resources on the line, I have all the confidence that I can go make money. Yeah. I've done it my whole life. Like making money is not hard to me. So is it risky for me to risk half my wealth, three quarters of my wealth, all my wealth, any of my, like it, it is and it isn't. If I believe in the vision and the idea and I'm running the show, I'm going to win. Yeah. Now, is it going to be how I want? Am I going to be number one? Winning doesn't always mean number one in business. Yeah. Right. Everbowl is never going to be bigger than Subway. Largest restaurant in the world. Sorry. Like, sorry to my investors. We're not going to beat Subway. I'm not going to have 44,000 Everbowls around the world. So can I win without beating Subway in total? Of course I can. Winning is a return on investment for my shareholders that is 
better than what they could do elsewhere and makes them happy and a great financial gain for me and my team right. at the Everbull side. And we have a lot of fun doing it. That's winning. So it's not football where there's only one winner and the rest of us are losers. Right. So define what winning is and then equate how much risk you're putting into it. Am I going to put $10 million on the line to win or earn or make a hundred grand? No, it's not worth the risk. Yeah. But if I put 10 million down and I have the chance to earn a billion dollars, okay, that's a reasonable risk. Yeah. I'm in. Let's go. Right. Right. And if I believe we can do it, I mean, I'm not launching ships to Mars. So I'm saying this in context, right? Like if you think about all the companies I did, they're not Elon Musk crazy. We're going to land stuff on Mars. Like that's a different world. Yeah. That's a higher risk, higher, different level of game. For most of us, we're starting Me Too businesses that have a new twist, a new face, a small disruptive element to it, a 3 to 5% improvement on what everyone else is doing, and guess what? You get to win. But you're following the formula, and you're doing it a little better. Yeah. Which is why it's easy to win. Or maybe not even better. I'm actually just following the formula. Yeah. Most don't. Yeah. Like there, it's Success is formulaic. You can follow. It's like a diet Yeah. or an exercise program. I'm sorry. Like, I don't need to see 7 million more exercise books. Yeah. We're not reinventing how humans are going to improve performance and get in shape. We understand what, do you burn more calories than you consume? Do you exercise and move your body in a way that is putting yourself under duress and, and creating lactic acid in the muscles and um, building your cardiovascular endurance? Like, are you doing these things? Yes or no? Yeah. If the answer is no, you're not going to get there. Right. Oh, I want to sit on my couch and do it with this little thing that's going to, okay, well, yeah. Enjoy that and tell me how it works. Yeah. Right? Or are you just going to follow the damn formula? Wake up every day and do it anyway. Yeah. Yes but, or no. But that's the thing, right? Like the formula with business is just do the work. Mm -hmm. Just do the work that other people don't want to do. Do more of it. Like my old boss used to always say, look, you're probably way more talented. You're probably a better salesperson. You're probably better looking than me, but you'll never outwork me. Mm -hmm. And he didn't just say that. Like he was there the first one in the office every day, looking great, good suit on. He was the last one out every day. And, and he did the same monotonous stuff every single day until they sold that company for millions and millions of dollars. That is definitely one, that is definitely one of the ways. You, know, um, you don't have to do it forever. You have to do it till you're a master of your craft mm. and your business. You know, As a serial entrepreneur, I get to spend my time in multiple companies. So I'm not the first in at Everbull and the last to leave every day anymore. Yeah. I was at the beginning. Right. Same at WeBuild. Same at my show. You know, now I have talented humans around me. I have a team of rock star people who are more talented than I am yeah. in every area of the business. And my job is to empower them and enable them with the right resources, ensure that we are all aligned on the vision, and ensure that the company is moving towards that end goal so I don't have to be in the forest for the trees. I can sit up top like a coordinator at a stadium watching the football game from up top mm -hmm. and call down the plays and, and make sure we're organized. I get to do that now. I yeah. didn't get to do that at the beginning. Same with my previous companies, same thing. But early on, it is do the work. Because when you are doing the work, you are going to notice when it's time to pivot. You are going to feel the vibrations of the industry. You are going to understand how the world is changing, the macro and micro things. And once you do that, you're going to recognize where all the opportunities are, and your team and you should be prepared to capitalize on them and pivot the company. Right. Everbull's not how it was when I started. The vision when I started is nowhere near where we are today. Right. We have pivoted seven, eight, nine times. Yeah. And sometimes do complete 180s. Well, I mean, COVID. Sure. Let's talk about what happened with Everbowl and COVID. I mean, it's, you know, it it was, I hate to say this because it was obviously detrimental to the world, but it was one of the best things that happened to Everbowl. Yeah. It forced us to make a pivot that I was not going to do. I was never going to franchise this business. I told everybody, I am not franchising. I had 28 corporate locations the day COVID happened. Zero interest in franchising. COVID happened. I laid off over just, just over 500 people, shut down 28 restaurants from March 18th till May 1st, and we made the determination to start franchising. Today, we have 100 plus locations around the country. We're partnering with incredible people. As a result of that, it allowed my other company, WeBuild, to go from just working on Everbulls to now doing what it does. And, you know, that's going to be a nine or 10 figure company by the end of 2025. Yeah. It was great financially. It was great. But if I wasn't in my business, yeah. I wouldn't have recognized that now's the time to pivot. Right. So you can't just put your head down and keep doing what you did yesterday. You have to be change ready. You have to be willing to restart. And that's the risk part. Complacency and comfort are detriments to progress in all things. Yeah. Right. I don't exercise because it's not comfortable. I sit on my couch and watch TV. It's comfortable. I don't get in shape. I don't like to do things I'm not good at. So I do the things I am good at, which 
has reached the ceiling of its lifeline in my business or in my main life. So I don't grow and I don't improve. And then I lose to a competitor who's willing to do those things. Yeah. So let's talk about entrepreneurs. Sure. Right? A lot of people, we, we talked on the phone a few weeks ago and uh, you, you sort of let me know uh, some feelings that you had about people that you see at these events. You're speaking on stage at these massive events. So you're seeing a lot of people. And one thing that I notice personally when I go to these conventions, I went to this convention, I don't go to a lot of them, right? When I go, I go for a considerable reason. Somebody's there that I want to see or I have something that I'm trying to improve on and I go for that reason. But I don't go all the time. But I went to this event in like 2017, 2018, right? And it was a, a great event. It was in Arizona. Uh, I met a lot of great people, big entrepreneurs were there, made some good connections. Awesome. I didn't go to another event for a couple of years. The next time I was there, I saw so many of the same people there, same people on stage, making the money, right? Selling products, doing their thing, but also the same people in the crowd who are like addicted to this, like half way, like they, they, they're like, oh, I'm just about to do something. But they never do it. Sure. They're always just about to do something. And they're just, it's like they're getting a rush from being there. And then that's all they do. Then they go back to whatever they were doing before. It's kind of like they're comic book readers, but their comics are conventions or yeah. self help videos or inspirational videos. There's a cohort of the population that watches inspirational videos every day, but they're actually inspired to just be inspired. They're not inspired to then take action. And that drives me nuts. Because I want everyone to take action because the world's going to be so much better when everyone does what their brilliance is and makes this world a better place and creates a bunch of wealth and all the cool things that will come. Right. So many great ideas are stuck in people's heads because they're waiting for this weird time of perfect or this thing that's never going to happen, which is zero risk and it all laid out on a silver platter for you. It's not going to happen. So you've got to take action. And so the entrepreneur is the person who wants to be an entrepreneur, but... I can't, I have mortgage, kids, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Then you don't really want to do it. Yeah. You're, you're a, I think I want to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> you need to go from that to actually taking the step. Well, they want it, but there's this, I think I, I believe well, we all that, want things, but do yeah. you really want them? Well, there's, there's gotta be some kind of self-limiting beliefs where they deep down don't think that they're deserving of it. Like, I think there's a lot of psychological stuff that stops people from going out and doing it. Cause look, I said something in a video today that I heard from somebody else, not my quote, but somebody said, you know, life is going to be hard no matter what you do, right? Uh, uh, you can go live an incredible life. You can go put in the work and live an amazing life. That's going to be really hard, right? It's really hard to build a successful business. It's really hard, but it's just as hard as going and living a mediocre life that you hate, yep. right? Like I, I think that it's so much harder to go live a life where you're getting up and you're working for somebody else that you hate, not if you like it, but that you hate, right? Like, cause we all know that job or for me, it was school. I hated every second of it. And when I was younger, I would just look at school like, holy shit. And when I'm done with this, there's another school sure. and then there's college. And so both of those are hard. So pick your heart. Yeah, choose your heart. I, I think the thing that you're passionate about that you really want is the easier version. Well, I'm just saying that Everybody wants lots of things. I want a lot of things. I wanted to be a sports agent. I went to law school. I got the job. Then I found out the sacrifice required to be a sports agent, and it exceeded my desire to want to do the job. Mm. But I didn't know that until I got it. Right? Be careful what you wish for. You might get it. Yeah. Right? That's my point. I think a lot of people want to be an entrepreneur. They just don't really know what's required. And then when they hear about it or see it, it's like, well, now I have all these built-in reasons why I shouldn't do those things. Yeah. Because they're exposed at these conferences to what's required. Right. I mean, what do most of the speakers talk about? Hard work. Yeah. Build your stuff. Take the risk. Buy this, my course. The, some of them. <laughs> I mean, some of them. And I'm not going to... Everyone ha Coaching and courses can help you if you can apply it. Yeah. But again, it takes the work. Of course. And I, mean, I don't sell... I don't, I don't have those things on stage. I'm not selling yeah. courses and coaching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you were a student of mine... I would only take you if you were going to do the work. Right. Because you're a reflection of me. Yeah. I can't have you take my course that I don't, you know, or coaching or whatever, and then not follow through. Yeah. Then I look terrible. Yeah. Because that means I'm a bad coach or a bad course operator or creator or whatever the term is. 
So the entrepreneur people, I'm I'm happy that they're taking the steps. I'm just, what are you waiting for? That that's my 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 point. What are you really waiting for? Do it today. You're not ready. Good. You'll get ready. Yeah. Take immediate decisive action. It's one of my my success formula principles. Do something today, right now. Take a step. You're interested in starting a podcast? Go to contentfactory.com. ContentFactorySanDiego.com. ContentFactorySanDiego.com, right? Take a step. Yeah. Put in the code and you get 50% off. Come here and film. If it's not what you want, you'll learn. But so what? You spend a few hundred or a couple thousand dollars and you create a little bit of content and you'll find out if you really want to do this. Yeah. Are you prepared? But think, well, what's involved? Okay. Let me plan and plan and plan and dream and dream and plan and dream and plan and dream and plan and dream and then ask questions and go to the events and come up to the speakers and shake their hand. Hey, I'd love to pick your brain and talk to you about it. Great. Okay. And then I have a conversation with you and six months from now I see, you. Oh, how, how'd it go? Oh, I haven't started yet. Okay. But I have some other ideas and okay. And then another year goes by and another year goes by and another year goes by. That's a entrepreneur. Stop it. Just take action. Yeah. The world is lived by people who do right. Those who do do and those who don't don't like right. it's, it's just that easy and it's not a race. And no one's going to judge you if it takes you 10 years to accomplish it. But do something right now to start that process. And as you start it, you're no longer an entrepreneur. Now you're doing it. Yeah. You're not doing it as fast as others. Who cares? And maybe it is a side hustle at first. Okay. I think you should get quickly away from that if you want to actually win. But for some people, that is the right step. Oh, I'm good with it as long as you're taking steps. I just am frustrated when I see people who can do it. They're extremely talented. They have all the capabilities in the world. They say they want to, but they're just not. <laughs> My brain doesn't work like that. And I want to push you to stop being comfortable and do it. And you'll just in time figure out all the things you have to do to get there. And then you reach out to mentors and coaches and say, I'm doing it. I'm dancing the dance. Yeah. I suck. I need help. What can I do better? Versus I want to dance but I don't know how. Okay. Talk to me when you're actually dancing. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's really important if you're asking people for their time. Like when I first moved here, I hit up Dan Fulkerson, one of our mutual friends, who's actually how we got connected. I hit up Dan Fulkerson and I had been friends with him on Facebook before I'd lived in San Diego. So I moved here. It's like 2017. I'm like, Hey, can we go out to lunch? And can you tell me some business stuff? Like, can you, can you help me? He's like, sure. And every single time I would ask him, I was like, man, this guy always says yes. He's always down to go to lunch for me. So one time I asked, hey, like, why do you always say yes to me? He's like, well, you go do it. Like every time you say, can you go to lunch? I give you some info and then you take that and you run with it. Like, and it's not that hard to do, but like if I go back to Dan and I'm like, hey, Dan, can I get your lunch? And then I ask him the same exact questions every time. What's Dan going to think? Like, I'm wasting my time. This kid's yes. not doing anything with this time, you know? But, well, also it's, not only is he wasting his time, but it's frustrating because he sees something in you. Yeah. You're wasting your talent. The world right. needs you to not do that. Yeah. Right? That's the benefit. But again, it just comes down to the work. Yeah, right? just do like, it. Like, Literally, like, Nike nailed it. Just do it. Yeah. It's not. It's way easier than everyone thinks it is. Yeah. But it's way harder to do it. Yeah. I don't know who the quote is, but uh, hard, work's, hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Every single time. Jeff, thank you so much for being on. I really appreciate it. What's next for you? What are, what are um, you doing? What's next? I mean, you've got WeBuild, which is just this behemoth, and it's going to keep going. <laughs> yeah. And, I mean, you're connected with all of these. You're speaking on stages. You have uh, great partnerships with very famous people. Like, you're you're up there. So yeah, um, what's, what's next? Well, we're opening Everbowls in Boston with Jason Tatum, who just won the, yeah, the NBA Finals as a Laker fan. It, it hurt, but... Um, I'm rooting for him and proud of him. And obviously, you know, champions are champions on and off the court. So who's going to buy the Celtics? Based on all those contracts that now they have to pay? I have no idea. It's not Fenway Sports Group, I don't think. No. I mean, those contracts are insane. Yeah. But I'm rooting for Jason. Yeah. Maybe. Congrats. Somehow I want Jason to win and I want him to win rings without the Celtics hanging banner. So hopefully they trade him to the Lakers and I can no. have all my dreams come true. But all that aside, uh, I'm excited to open some stores with him and the partnership with what we're doing is fantastic. He's such an incredibly humble young man who who really has uh, got the world in front of him. And he is who he is on and off the court, which is why he's a champion. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, doing a lot more speaking. I'm excited, 
you know, to meet more people around the country and hopefully inspire those entrepreneurs to become entrepreneurs and the entrepreneurs who are doing the dance to really work through the stuff that I figured out through mentorship and coaching and how I've been able to, to use it. If I can pay it forward and help others, I'd like to. And we build, you know, doing its thing and we're growing. We just opened a big facility in, in just outside of Atlanta and working now opening some gyms. We're going to be opening Mark Wahlberg's new gym in Vegas called municipal. Wow. And, um, man, you're really hitting up Boston, huh? Yeah, I know. Right. But it's in Vegas. So I'm yeah, okay. yeah. That's yeah. Good. Actually, I've never even been to Boston. What? It's the only oh, city, dude. only city in America that I really big city I've never been to. Dude, it's it's the uh, my family's from East Boston, and I spent a lot yeah. of time out. I mean, a good portion of my life there. And Boston's a good place. And Everbowl, if you're near any of those colleges, you guys are gonna dominate. Well, we're, the first one's in Woburn. Woburn, yeah. Woburn. Yep. Just uh, get my haircut there. Yeah. So you'll have to get in an like Everbowl the Woburn now. Center area. Yep. Or, yep. Yeah. Um, and then you know we're gonna continue to expand and see what we can do and keep doing my best every day and. Help as many people as I can and make friends, have fun, make some money. Nice. Yeah. Hey, man, you're I'm I'm loving watching you blow up. Like I remember when you when Everbowl first was like taking off, and uh, I you know I love hearing like Dan Fulkerson had an opportunity to invest <laughs> in Everbowl and he didn't do it, and you just fucking blew up. And he's like, man, this that was the biggest you know missed ship of my life. But it's so cool watching people that obviously respect you and always respect you watching you. Uh, outperform people and and just continue to just go up and up and up. So I'm I'm really uh, grateful that you gave me your time today. And every time that we talk, you're you're always open to giving me your time, which is the most valuable thing you have. So thank you. And keep crushing it. Well, thank you. It's my pleasure. And honestly, all I do is I wake up, I work my ass off, I go to bed. Yeah. Do that. You look back. You do a. You you get quite a lot of progress. So. Yeah. But thank you for having me. Uh, studio's great. Thank you. As I said, if you're in San Diego, I I don't make anything by saying this. This isn't a sales pitch, but definitely come on down here. Take advantage of this opportunity because a lot of content creators don't create content because they don't have a studio. Now you have one available and it's very affordable. And, you know, Kevin and his team will take care of you. So thanks, man. Appreciate it. Thanks for coming down. My pleasure.